Well, good day. I'm Joel, one of the pastors. Good to be with you and worshiping the King of Kings. He is our Lord. Amen. Amen. Is he your King? Amen. Amen. And so we get to come and celebrate him today. Um, I'm going to be diving into Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 11 today. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 11. If you want to go ahead and turn there, you can. Before I do that, though, uh, I need to speak with you about something that we're trying to do, working on here as a ministry at Chapel Point. Um, we're looking at expanding uh, or at least adding seats, about 400 seats in this worship center. Um, and as we're doing that, we decided uh, middle of April, well, we only have about four or five weeks, six weeks to do this. So here we go. Uh, Three and a half million dollars. Uh, can we do it? So today and next Sunday are the big pledge days. I know that today's Memorial Day, but we're asking everybody to participate if you call this your church home. Uh, and that matters for the bank, by the way. They're like, oh, okay, a lot of people are participating. We want to participate. Um, so you'll see Barnabas boxes out there. Why is it named Barnabas? Because Barnabas, uh, with the movement of God, he, first thing we learn about him in Acts chapter 4, he went and sold land, gave all the money to the, uh, the followers of Jesus and said, use this how you need to to grow the kingdom. So um, that is the heart posture that we want. I just want to remind you of that. That's this week and next week. Um, as we move forward. If we don't do it this year, because we're trying to do it in such a concise period of time, we'll do it next year. Um, but that's something we're trying to push on right now. We got eight days for two, at least 200 families to commit and $2 million. For God, that's nothing, right? I'm, I'm, I'm feeding my heart right now. For God, that's nothing, right? <laughs> um, and God will do a marvelous work. Cindy Morse is a wonderful lady who goes to our church, Cindy and Dennis, um, and they've been here for a long time. And I want to show you a brief video of me interviewing her. Um, later this week, we're going to send another video, uh, which is a longer version of what you're going to see today. It lasts about two, two and a half minutes. And I just want you to be encouraged by somebody who I know since I've been here um, has just been a faithful woman of prayer and helping to lead this ministry um, after walking through so many difficult things. So let's take a moment and watch this video together. Hello, Chapel Point. Pastor Joel here, and I'm with a dear sister, Cindy Morse. She is one of the individuals in which I, I remember well from the last decade, primarily because of your willingness to be a prayer warrior. What does Jesus mean to you? Honestly, he's my life. He's my breath. When I had cancer and they said they were going to take um, a lobe out and I would not be able to breathe, I just looked at the doctor and I said, Jesus is in my lungs. He'll get us through. I've always had Jesus. Well, something, so we, were, we were in a meeting, one of the desserts that we we're having here at the church, and you, you told a story publicly, so I feel like I can mention it now, where you guys didn't know that we're, we're doing everything we can to move the kingdom forward, but that means we have a lot of new believers in the church. We have a lot of people who aren't, aren't believers in the church. We have pe some people who will say, yes, I'm a believer, but they don't contribute. And then you told a story about your own kitchen. Yes. Um, we've been in this house 20 years. It's 40 years old. The cupboards, Dennis literally patches together because they fall off. But we've been saving all these years because we knew we weren't going to have a pension. So it's, we ordered the cupboards, and it's expensive, very expensive. If we would have known that we were a half a million dollars behind in our, I wouldn't have done my kitchen the way it did. It took my breath away when I first heard that, but it also made me trust more in my God when you said that $300,000 had been paid in less than a month. Yeah, and that's really encouraging because we want to do it together. Um, God has called us, we're in the family business of reaching lost people, and we want all the family members to help. When I, I hear your story, and how God's using it. You see those stories in other people and how God can use them. And I think my prayer is that you would hear from someone like Miss Cindy here and 
that you would take that and go, wait, I have a story also. Uh, you can still give your life to something that is your breath, that is your life. And that person is Jesus. So be encouraged by this, and may you walk joyfully in the Lord. And if you ever want to go say hey to Cindy, she's often in the prayer room. We have people who pray throughout each of our services. uh, That every single one of you, whether you're watching online, one of the sites, it doesn't matter, would come to encounter more of who God is. Today, Together series, Philippians 2, 1 through 11. Open up the Word of God if you would. Before I even go to the Word of God, though, I'm going to ask you to think about one number. Every single day in the world, how many selfies do you believe are posted? Not taken, that's a different thing. Click, click, right? Posted every single day, shared with the world to see. How many every single day? I want you to think about that number for just a moment. But first, we're going to then jump into the Word of God. Will you please stand? to acknowledge the power of God's truth and God's word. 1 through 11 today, we're going to go ahead and start off by looking at 1 through 8. I'll go into 9 through 11 later on. This is the word of God. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, if you have any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love. Being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others more important, more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but to the interest of others. Have this mind, have this attitude among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He, take the form, he took the form of a bondservant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Every single day, how many selfies are posted throughout the world? And by the way, if anybody can come and answer to me, why is it that when people take a, pose, a, a selfie, they have to pucker a little up? If you can answer that, I don't understand that whatsoever. Ladies, if that's you and you think that's going to get a guy, you don't want that guy. Okay, I just want to help you out a little bit. I don't really understand that. But how many selfies do you think are taken every day and then posted? Far more are taken. How many are posted every day? Give me a number. Okay, somebody just said 93 million. That means they were in the first service. Don't be that guy. <laughs> don't, don't be that guy. I know. Um, yeah, 93 million selfies. I just heard it on the radio. So I don't even really know the accuracy of, of it. But I look at it and go, 93 million selfies are posted every single day. 92.8 million have puckered lips. I don't know that. I just made that up. But it's just like 93 million selfies are taken every day. Now, the reason I'm sharing this with you is the book of Philippians is a postcard of selfless living. Especially Philippians chapter 2. If somebody says, why is Philippians chapter 2 so important? It is, I think, one of the most significant, important chapters that we have in the Word of God. Truly. I love them all. I get it. But Philippians 2 is one of the most significant and important chapters that we have in Scripture. I believe that. And in Philippians chapter 2, we're going to be looking at this the next three weeks. And as we're looking at Philippians chapter 2, it is the postcard, the mark of selfless living. So you have selfless, say it. And then selfish, say it. There, it is. No, But it's selfless living. It's a postcard, a mark of what that is. And yet that's hard today. And the reason we can struggle with this passage, if we really unpack it thoroughly, is because we live in a world that is all about self. It, it really is. Everything, even when we try to gain, often we'll do something that we think is right in order to gain something for self. It is so deep within us, within our culture, 
And so we get to look at this ultimate goal for the believer. And the ultimate goal for the believer, here's here's your goal, to live a selfless life for Jesus Christ. That's your goal. To live a selfless life for Jesus Christ. And so he's been building, obviously, on Philippians chapter 1, which he's been exhorting them. And now he's going to speak really to the unity, the humility, the love that the believers should be having along with one another. Now, I want to remind you, Paul, when he first went to Philippi and started the church there, which missionary journey was it for him? Second. You, I, I, every week I'm trying to help you and you're... St- <laughs> um, second missionary journey, he goes to Philippi. Now he's in prison. Where is he in prison? Rome. He's in Rome in prison, writing to the people of Philippi because they've already sent people like Epaphroditus with resources and funds to help him, to support the ministry, to support the New Testament church. He's been doing all of this. Um, He's even written in 1 Thessalonians thanking the people of Philippi. Hey, when nobody else is there, you guys have always supported me. You've always prayed. You've always been a part of the ministry. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you for your partnership and the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it gives you a little bit of context for this. Here's Paul writing to the people of Philippi, and he's going to be exhorting them toward unity. Now, unity is going to be a unique word that he keeps speaking about because unity, biblical unity is far more than getting along with or even tolerating the people around you. It's far more than that. It's far more important than that important than that in terms of what it, it accomplishes. So he is going to jump into this, and this is how he begins. And I'm gonna, I, I want to make sure that we walk out of this place today going, oh, okay, yeah, here's the challenge. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to walk verse by verse, and it, this is what it communicates. It says, if you have these things, this is verse 1, if you have these things, you must, you will do these things, with a heart like Jesus, with a mind like Jesus, in order to exalt Jesus. That's what this passage says. So he jumps in and he he says the following to the people. He says, so hey, friends, if you have any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from his love, any participation in the spirit, if you have any affection and sympathy in Christ, the, the if here in Greek is more like since you have. It's somewhat rhetorical. He's like, of course you have these things. So he says to them, since you have, anybody ever received encouragement knowing Jesus Christ? Yes? Anybody ever had comfort from God? Yes? So he knows this. He's writing to the believer. So he's stating, well, since you have encouragement in Christ, some translations say consolation, um, which is the Greek word periklesis, and it's really encouragement. It's like, since you have received this encouragement, since you have received this strength in Jesus Christ, you will do these things. You must do this. Well, since you've been encouraged in Christ, you have to do this. Since you've received comfort from his love, 2 Corinthians 1.3 says that God is the God of all comfort. 2 Corinthians 1.3, so since you have received comfort in the love of God, since you've been encouraged in the love of God, since you've received strength in the name of Jesus Christ, since you have received comfort from Jesus Christ and who he is, since you have received fellowship in the spirit, the Greek word koinonia, since you've received this fellowship with one another and the power of what it is to share life together, we see that right away forming in the New Testament church, Acts chapter 2, right? Acts chapter 2 is... Um, and beginning uh, or starting there is really the beginning of the New Testament church. And we see that Peter's first Christian sermon, Acts chapter two, and it talks about koinonia, the fellowship that the people had. That's what Barnabas had, this fellowship. So he was willing to share and to be gracious and to be generous. So here comes Paul writing from prison saying, hey, if you guys, since you have encouragement in Christ, since you already have comfort from his love, since you have fellowship with one another and you're sharing and having all things in common, and since you have affection and sympathy with each other, right? That's the Christian's experience. Well, then you're going to do verse two. So if you've ever received strength or comfort or fellowship in the spirit in Christ Jesus, then you're going, to, you're going to live out verse 2. Verse 2 says, 
complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, which is unity, and of one mind. So since you have encouragement, since you have strength, since you have comfort, since you have fellowship, since you have affection, you're going to complete my joy by being like-minded. Here's his like-mindedness. Where is he again writing from? Prison. And yet, the theme of the book of Philippians is no matter the circumstance that you are to have the joy of the Lord. And yet in today's world, we have a hissy fit when we don't get anything we don't want. It was probably about three weeks ago and I just felt bad for mom. You never know what day somebody's really having. You never know who's standing in front of you. And I just felt bad for her because this kid really wanted a pack of gummies at the checkout. I wish grocery stores, if you run grocery stores throughout the nation, stop putting candy at the cash register. (laughs) Please. And this kid is wanting gummies there and just has a complete meltdown and is on their back kicking and throwing their hands and feet. I want gummies. So the mom just, I loved it. Good job, mom. Left the entire cart of groceries, grabbed that kid, took it outside, and I don't know if they're still around today. (laughs) But they wanted those gummies. 30 seconds of taste in the mouth. They wanted them, and that's the world in which we live. And so here comes Paul writing from prison and says, hey, listen, if you have any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any fellowship in the Spirit, you're going to make my joy complete by having the same mindset, the same love, and being in unity. You're going to sacrifice your preferences. You're going to sacrifice the things that you might want that are temporary so that the name of Christ would be glorified. That's what he's doing. You're not going to throw your feet and kick and everything else. And you, no, you must make, you may make my joy complete. Carry this joy with you everywhere you go. So if you have these things, and since you have these things, you must do this. Make my joy complete by being in the same mind, the same love, being in unity with one another in one mind. Well, if you're supposed to do this, verse three and four lets us know, well, this is the heart we should have then. And this is where it is remarkable because here's Paul writing from prison, but he's going to speak to who Jesus is. I I truly think verses three through eight, especially three through eight, especially help us to understand. It's one, it's one of the chapters that paints a picture of who Jesus is. It gives the ingredients for, hey, if you really want to be as much like Christ as possible, here you go. It's the ingredients for the cake that you're making, right? Well, if your life is to be reflective of Jesus, here are the ingredients so your life can be reflective of Jesus Christ. It's the ingredients for unity, right? Because Unity comes because we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, because we're, we're committed to the truth of Scripture and to God's Word, Right, to me, even that's, that's the high priestly prayer in John 17, 17. And he speaks about what that leads to. And he's going to paint this picture with the life of Jesus Christ. This is what he says, verse 3 and 4, which start there. He says, do nothing. So he paints the picture. Do nothing from selfish ambition. Say selfish ambition. Don't do it. Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit. Or I think it just says the word conceit here in the ESV. Don't, don't do anything like that. He gives two don't do's, and then he's going to give you the model what to do. Don't do anything from selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourself. So here are these not to do's, this selfish ambition. No selfish ambition, right? Much of what we do today is for our own advancement. Even sometimes we do what we think is the right thing to do, but it's in order to advance ourselves, Right? Well, I'm going to do this, this, and this. It is the right thing to do, but hopefully at the end of the day, I'm going to get what I want as a result of doing those things. We even parent that way. Hey, if you'll do these three things, then you can, get, you can have the rest of the day to yourself. No, that's not the life of a believer, though. 
No selfish ambition. Now, it doesn't say that ambition is wrong, but our greatest, our greatest ambition should be to glorify Jesus Christ. And it certainly is to be selfless, not selfish. And so we have this ambition that is kind of in our, our gut, our, our heart that says, I'm going to promote Jesus Christ as best that I can. He says, no selfish ambition, no conceit. Conceit is thinking too highly of oneself. And scripture says, do not think more highly of yourself than you ought to. So we already know that. And he's painting a picture of Jesus, right? Here it is for us. And he's like, he didn't think too highly of himself, even though he's deity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's the Trinity. God came in flesh in Bethlehem, but he was already in existence from the beginning of time. No conceit. The dictionary says this about the word conceit. An excessively favorable opinion of one's own ability and importance. We are loved dearly, yes, by the God of creation who gave his son's life for us, but you're not that important. Is it okay that I say that? I'm okay saying it. Why? Because our life is about him, not us. And so if you have these things, if you have encouragement and strength and comfort, you must complete my joy by being like-minded. And you must have his heart, which is no selfish ambition, no conceit. It means that you count others better than yourself. Now that's hard. Because we have standards in our world, and so then we look at others based on whether or not they've achieved those standards. And so when it says, don't consider yourself better than others, but yet consider others better than yourself, it's this contradiction to the attitude of the world. Because sometimes we want to say, but I am better. I mean, that's just real life for us. We look at it and go, wait, but I've done this and this. I am better. I have more education. I am better. And we we start to put these standards on how we weigh things. But yet we know God loves all people and God can redeem anyone from anything. And we know this. And yet sometimes we go, yeah, but I'm more redeemable. it's easier to redeem me than to redeem somebody else because you got no idea what they did. Do you know what they did? And that's how we look at other people. And he says, no, don't count other, don't don't count yourself as being better. Count others better than yourself. This This is how Charles Spurgeon says it. He says, men don't quarrel. Men don't, this is talking about, man, you want to look at the unity that came from this? Men don't quarrel when their ambitions have come to an end. When their selfish ambition has come to an end, there is no more quarreling because now you share the same purpose, the same mission, which is to proclaim Jesus Christ. The church would do well to know this. If we would simply preach the authenticity, the genuineness, the the power of the truth of the word of God and and stop getting so captivated by other things. Right before the first service this morning, somebody came to me like, what's it feel like to be serving in the ministry for 10 years now and blah, blah, blah. And they said, and somebody um, out by the children's area, they're like, give me a story. I was like, oh man, coffee. They're like, what do you mean coffee? I'm like, I like it. Um, and they said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, and, and it's the story of where we, we had those giant um, silver coffee pots that percolate. You know what I'm talking about? They're great. It's super. But when you drink it, you taste the metal. You, like it was that kind of thing. And so we got, we got some new coffee pots. It was like six months in and they were nice. Um, and this family came up to me like, how dare you spend the church's money this way? We're leaving. What they didn't know is the coffee pot was donated. And I didn't tell them because I wanted them to leave. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> and then we, get, we make such a big deal over certain things. I wish we had the same attitude of my neighbor doesn't know Jesus and I haven't spoken to him. 
What if we went to brothers and sisters in Christ and we said, how, how dare, instead of how dare you buy that coffee maker, which I didn't buy, but how dare you buy that coffee maker? What if we went in and said, you love Jesus. You claim to know the author and the perfecter of life who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. How aren't you telling your friends about how his love and his forgiveness and his grace has totally redeemed your life? That is the epitome. That is the definition of selfishness. To know the creator and to know eternal life, to know forgiveness, to know grace and to know mercy and not share it with people. Like you're going to have to help me understand that one. Because you start to see other people differently. And now you're not even, you're, you're living with a heart like Jesus. And you're not even looking at your own interests. But you're looking out for the interest of others. The, it's saying, yeah, you're going to serve like Jesus. That's the heart posture. I, I've learned, I, lo- I do, I genuinely enjoy serving people. Now, I think most of the time it comes from a good place. Sometimes it comes from a bad place. Meaning insecurities and different things like that. Sometimes I want to serve because I can hide there and I just kind of want to be left alone. So that's why I'm saying sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. But what I've learned is a lot of times we're not even comfortable with people serving us. That's how foreign it is. No, no, don't serve me. You just sit here. No, no, God made us to serve Jesus Christ. I have not come to be served, but to, we already know this. We say it all the time. That should be our posture. Don't rob me from the very thing God actually created me to do. And to look at the interest of others and what they need to grow in my concern for them and my heart for them. I don't care where you are, where you've been, what you've done. Hear me say God loves you, gave his son's life for you and God can redeem and bring hope and peace and comfort and it's amazing. And so since you've encountered comfort and love and fellowship, you have to complete my joy by making it full with like-mindedness. And you have to do it with his heart, with no selfish ambition. Look at others better than yourself. And then verse five, you have to do it with his thinking, his mind. His, uh, another word here for um, mind is, I, I memorized this chapter in the original NIV, which they don't even make anymore. And so it said attitude. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Your attitude, your thinking, your mind should be like Christ Jesus. And by the way, this chapter changed my life. It's the chapter that made me go, I knew how to live in church. I didn't know how to live like Jesus. So I memorized it when I was high school. And it shifted my thinking from that point on. And he says, I want you to live with the mind of Jesus, the attitude of Jesus Christ. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ. He's like, be like this. He's talking about the, I think he's really speaking about the magnitude of the incarnation. The the magnitude of the incarnation of Christ. And the thinking that he had and the mind that he had. Be like this. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 6 says that we are to have the literally instructs us to have the mind of Christ. So the, the, the difficulty comes with thinking that Jesus came to alter our heart, alter our thinking. He did not. He came to change it. That's why it says, Paul says to the Corinthians in a different passage, he says, the old is gone, the what? New has so the, he's, not, he's saying, hey, here's the, the old remains and I'm going to tweak it. Does he say that? Yes or no? He says, the old is now gone. That's, that's there. When you come to know Jesus Christ, there's, there's a renewal, a replacement. It's like, that, that's done. The new has come. And I think that's part of the reason we can struggle with this passage and others as well is because we think that God has come to tweak who we are. No, he doesn't come to tweak who we are. He has come to replace who we are through the power of the resurrection. The tomb is empty. We get that, right? To have that type of thinking. So yes, since you've received encouragement and strength and all these things, that means you must make my joy complete with a heart like Jesus, with a mind like Jesus, 
so that you can live like Jesus. Verse 6 through 8. So that you can live like Jesus. Verse 6 says, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself and took on the nature of a slave, a bondservant, and humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And we start to recognize that Jesus was, he was God. He was in the form of God. And he did not surrender his deity, but he did surrender all else in order to take on our sin, in order to take on the shame that we have, the guilt that we have in life. And he didn't cling on to these privileges of deity that could have rescued him. And listen, it was the night before his, uh, before his crucifixion. And he is, of course, in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? And he's praying and it talks about sweating beads of blood and just the pain and the agony in his own life. And he could have called upon the Father. But he says, God, I don't want this, but if it's your will. I, I, don't, I don't want it, but if it's your will. So he was willing to no longer grasp on to what he had in terms of his own deity, but he was going to allow himself to take on the suffering of the world. He didn't cling to, hold on to the privileges of deity. He made himself of no reputation. He's so another translation, he, he gave up his own reputation. What if, we could, what if we were no longer concerned with our reputation, only the name of Jesus? But what are they going to think? This is the definition of my life, by the way. Living in that tension and wrestling with it. Because I'll say, I don't really care what people will say or think as long as I get to preach the scriptures. But then when they say certain things, it also still just really hurts. And so I say the right thing and you do the godly until your what catches up? Your heart. You just do the godly until your heart catches up. And so I strive to do the godly until my heart catches up, but it still impacts you, doesn't it? Well, Jesus wasn't concerned with his reputation says he emptied, kenosis, K-E-N-O-S-I-S is a word there in Greek, kenosis. He emptied himself. He, he, there, he, right? That's what it's conveying. He, he emptied himself for us. Took on the form of a slave, a bond servant. It's the same word here that's used to talk about his mom when the angels came to her in Matthew and said, hey, guess what? You're gonna have a, a child. No, 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 I'm not married and... Yeah, I know, you have a child. And she, her response was, I am your slave, your bondservant. It's the same word there. I am your bondservant. So now here, here Paul is using to describe Jesus and saying, he took on the form of a bondservant. He took on the form of a slave on our behalf. Coming in the likeness of men and being a found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Definition, there's humility. He humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He endured suffering on our behalf. Right? He, Hebrews 5.8, great passage to remind us of the need for that. He, Hebrews 5.8 tells us very clearly, it says, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. He was willing to be obedient to the point of suffering. I'll do everything I can up to this point. No, he didn't have that attitude. He just said, I will become obedient to the point of suffering. To the point of death. Friends, crucifixion was gruesome. Crucifixion wasn't, it was so gruesome, it was against the law to crucify a Roman. They wouldn't let that happen because they didn't want their own people to go through something like that. And so it's this shameful death. Um, Deuteronomy tells us, Deuteronomy 21, 23, Galatians 3, 13, lets us know that you're even considered cursed by God if you're crucified because it was so bad.
It was so hard. Yet there was no limit to what Christ wouldn't do in order to show the power of his love. So since you know, this is Paul writing from prison saying, hey guys, since you know encouragement, since you know strength, since you know comfort from the love of God, I know you're going to make my joy complete by being like-minded and you're going to do it with the heart of Jesus and the mind and thinking of Jesus so that you can live like Jesus. Guys, we, we need to start moving from respect of Christ to wanting to actually emulate Christ. You see the difference, right? In today's world of selfishness, we'll respect someone, but we don't want to be like them because we already think so highly of ourselves. We're like, look at me. Selfie. Look at me. Look at me. I want everybody to see what I eat for dinner. Nobody cares. Sure, I mean, like, I think we do it to encourage other people. Look at what this person did for me. And how about just look at them in the eyes and say, thank you so much and offer a prayer for them. That should be enough. Right? Because we've made a world that really just resounds over and over. It's this banging gong of look at me, look at me. When the point of the the life of a believer is look at Jesus, look at Jesus. That's the point that, that we have. That's the main thrust we have in life. And so do these things. And as a result, this is what came, 9 through 11. As a result, this is what comes. It says, therefore, God has highly exalted. That, uh, that highly exalted can also be translated as super exalted, which, which is fantastic. So therefore, God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So since you've received all this, you're going to make my joy complete by living like this with Jesus' heart, with Jesus' mind, and living like him in, in every way possible, and even consider others better than yourself. And as a result of that, God came and exalted his name. He exalted the name of Jesus. He gave him the name which is above every name. Right? There's, it's the name, in many ways, it's to think of Yahweh. There's no greater name than Yahweh. Here he is. He's like, oh, this is God. And it tells the whole world is to be brought under and into submission to the Son. Those, and it says very clearly, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That's absolutely everybody. It's complete submission to Jesus Christ, both in word, which is tongue. Everybody say tongue and knee. Tongue and knee. Say it again. Tongue is in word. Knee is in action. He says every knee will bow. This should be our, we should just start walking around on our knees. He says that the result of who Jesus Christ is, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. So in every action and in every word, our life, because since we have received strength, since we have been empowered by him, since we know the comfort of all of God's love and who he is and what he's done, I go make my joy complete by being like minded with the heart of Jesus and with the mind and the thinking of Jesus and declare the power of who he is. That should be our life. He is not an addition to who you currently are. He replaces who you are with the power of the resurrection. So I just want to shake the church today. I want to shake the rust off of the church today. Because the reality is, I don't think that we sometimes serve, I don't think we process that we serve a king worth speaking about. So God exalted him, bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. The name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That Jesus Christ is Lord. That Jesus Christ is Lord. That Jesus Christ is what? Lord. Lord. 
uh, in the Roman Empire. Remember, Paul's in prison in what city? Rome. And he's writing to them. And in the Roman Empire, uh, it was required that you would swear an oath of allegiance to Caesar as Lord. That's what was required. And the Christians started getting in a lot of trouble for this because they stopped doing it because their allegiance was to the Lord Jesus Christ. And many people even lost their life for that. Because they refused to start participating in that. But the word Lord um, is really interesting because I, I think we look at Jesus as, do you really look at him as Lord? There, um, there's a book, it's not in print anymore. It's called Disciple by Juan Carlos Ortiz. Um, it's, a, it's a somewhat of a version of like a C.S. Lewis mere Christianity, I would say, if you've ever read that. But I want to read to you, this is how he begins the entire thing, chapter one. Uh, he's from South America, but let's see what he says. He says, we have an interesting problem in Spanish with the word Lord. If you're fluent in Spanish, maybe you already know this. Lord is Senor, the same word we use for Mr. We say Senor Smith, Senor William, Senor Jesus. It's as if in English we were to say Miss, Mr. Smith, Mr. Williams, Mr. Jesus. The result in Spanish is that we've lost the Lord concept. To call Jesus the Lord, Senor, doesn't really say anything very strongly. But since I've come among English-speaking people, I have found that you have the same problem. Even though you have two separate words, Mr. and Lord, in your language, maybe it's because you think of the lords of England, who some of them have not been very admirable. Lord doesn't mean today what it meant when Jesus was here. Back then it meant the maximum authority, the first one, the one above everything else, the owner of all creation, the Greek word for Lord, kurios, right? In small letters was how slaves addressed their masters. But if the word is capitalized, and if you don't know that in scripture, you'll see sometimes the, the name Lord is all lower, sometimes it's all capital. Here's the difference. If the word is capitalized, it referred only to one person in the whole Roman Empire. Caesar of Rome was the Lord. As a matter of fact, when public employees and soldiers met in the street, they had to say a greeting. Caesar is Lord. The response, yes, the Lord is Caesar. So the Christians had a problem. When they were greeted with Caesar is the Lord, they answered, no, Jesus Christ is the Lord. That got him in trouble. Not because Je Caesar was jealous of the name. It was far deeper than that. Caesar knew that the Christians really meant that they were committed to another authority. And in the balance scale of their lives, Jesus Christ weighed more than Caesar weighed. Does Jesus weigh enough to you? Sit in it for a moment. Does Jesus weigh enough to you? So that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow, every tongue, tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. To the glory of God the Father. Here's what 9 through 11 tells us. Just very, very briefly. It tells us that we are to declare Jesus as Lord. If you want to know, hey, since you've already encountered all these wonderful things, and if you want to know if you're living with his heart and with his attitude and his mind, these are the things that you do. You declare Jesus as Lord. You bow before Jesus as Lord. You confess Jesus before others and you give him glory. Glory upon glory upon glory upon glory upon glory. That's the response. Like, is, is, is this your posturing you're walking through life with? Right? I just got to bow before his name. I'm, he's not an addition. He's, he's replaced the old. The, the new has come. I, I've got grace and hope and salvation through Jesus Christ. Are you giving him the glory that he deserves? 
God, I thank you for who you are, your power and your strength. And since we have been encouraged by who you are, since then, because we know that we have come before you to be comforted, we will live with your heart. God, give us the the courage to live according to your heart, your mind, your thinking, your way, so that we can live according to your life and declare that Jesus is Lord to declare that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God, may we not receive attention for anything. May you receive all attention. May we make much more of Jesus, more Jesus, more Jesus, more Jesus. God, when we are so self-absorbed that we don't even know how to live a selfless life, forgive us. Shape our hearts to reflect your goodness. In Christ's name, amen.